Now, Christopher Hitchens, the um, atheist, in his um, book, God is Not Great, um, makes the point that the behavior of um, ordinary believers in the church is often so appalling that it's the single greatest argument, he puts it, to, um, to argue against the existence of God. And I suppose when you think about it, um, the conduct of leaders in the church, particularly when there have been scandals around the leaders um, in the church acting in a corrupt or abusive way, is an even stronger argument. Um, you know, whether or not it undermines the existence of God, it certainly raises serious questions. I mean, after all, you can't claim that leaders aren't representative. Um, they presumably know the central truths of Christianity. They are chosen usually because they're representative. And it raises serious questions about God. If God is there, why doesn't he do something about it? How does he let his leaders get away with it? Is he going to do anything about it? I know many believers for whom the conduct of leaders, sadly, is a reason that undermines their faith when it should be something that builds their faith up. And that is very much what's going on here in this passage. And the reason we're going to be looking at it, particularly with that focus, is um, partly because the passage is speaking to it directly, but also because of recent events. Just this last week, on Monday and Tuesday, there was a two-part documentary um, by BBC Panorama looking into the abuse of Bishop Peter Ball, who is the Bishop of um, Lewes, um, and his abuse and the way that it was covered up, awfully covered up by the Church of England, a fact which is now public record on the back of some independent child sex abuse inquiries. Unless we think that that's a bit out there and doesn't directly affect us, recently on the 26th of December on Boxing Day, front page news on the Daily Telegraph were the allegations of abuse that have been leveled against Jonathan Fletcher, the former vicar of Manuel Wimbledon, for physical and emotional abuse with a sadomasochistic element to it. Thankfully now, the, um, this has been looked into by the leadership of Emmanuel Wimbledon, triggered by their incumbent Robin Weeks, and they're doing an independent inquiry into it, the results of which should be released later on this year. So we can't claim it's not the evangelicals, we can't claim it's not in the Church of England, this is something that's close to home. Now, as I say this, to put my cards on the table, I think both Mark and I are aware at the moment that the church family here is going through some difficult things. Some people have lost some loved ones recently. There are some people who are battling with physical illness or injury, others with mental illness and challenges at the moment. And in many ways, we would love to preach a message of comfort to you. That, that was the message last week, and if that's where you're at, please go back and listen to what the Lord was saying to us from the first um, chapter and a bit of uh, Samuel. But this is the message we've got this week, and this is an important area, and we've got to grapple with it as a church family. So come with me as we look and try to work out what the Lord is doing in a situation like we see in this passage, when the leadership has reneged on its responsibilities and has become corrupt and abusive. What is the Lord going to do about that? Two points. The first point is corrupt and weak leaders who are exposed in verses 11 to 26. Corrupt and weak leaders who are exposed. The first thing I want you to notice is that God and the Bible does not do cover-ups. He does not do whitewashing. You might think that propaganda is a 20th century invention invented by um, totalitarian states at the beginning of the 20th century and then picked up and run with by the political elite today to try and push their own particular agenda, but it's not. It's been around for thousands of years. The ancient Near East and the other civilizations around at the time, like Israel, would all indulge in propaganda. If their leaders failed, they did not make it a matter of public record. If you doubt it, go and look at some of the Babylonian transcripts um, in the um, British Library or the Assyrian transcripts. You will not see a list of their misdemeanors. They never did it. But the Bible is unique because when its leaders fails, it talks about it. More than that, you'll see here a forensic analysis because this is what the Lord sees. His church has never done under the Lord's guidance, cover-ups. Those who do that are not acting in the Lord's name. Look at verse 12. Eli's sons were scoundrels, a mild translation for a more serious word. The word in Hebrew is Belial. It means his sons were sons of destruction. It's a very strong phrase. It literally means that's all they ever brought, that's all they were ever good for, destruction. And then we get this expose, this forensic analysis of what they did in real detail. And we hear about how they would go along when people were offering sacrifices, and despite the fact that they were funded 
by the people of Israel in their priestly position, that as people sat down after the sacrifice to do what was called the peace offering, where they would boil meat and have a meal with the Lord with the remainder of the meat that hadn't been sacrificed to God as a special act of devotion, they would interrupt that family affair and they would take their fork or the servant would take a fork and he would plunge it into the middle of the family stew and pot and they would pull out the meat and they would go off with that. And no matter how much people protested, they would take it by force if they wanted to. And sometimes they would do worse than that, deciding they didn't want boiled meat, they wanted fresh meat. They would actually interrupt the first part of the sacrifice and take the choicest cut of meat that was supposed to be offered to the Lord, and they would take it for themselves. Such is the nature of their corrupt and abusive practices. And I want you to see, secondly, that as this is analyzed and put forward in full detail before it. The reason the Scripture does this is so that we can see it as it really is and we can understand it so that we can be warned about it and we can avoid it. Notice three factors that come about for this abusive, corrupt leadership to really take root. First of all, there's the greed and the sexual immorality on the part of the leaders, Hophni and Phinehas. We clearly get a sense of their greed in verses 12 to 15, and then we're told in verse 22, now Eli was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they slept with the women even, who served at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. So this is idolatry, it's distorted appetites for sex, um, greediness, material wealth and prosperity, and that's the first thing where leadership goes wrong, is when any leader indulges those distorted desires, leaves them unchecked in his or her life, you start to get this distortion coming up. But secondly, you also need the second condition, which is the position of a leader in power. Look at what they say at the end of verse 16. If anyone would resist, they would say, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. Uh, we have the phrase, um, don't we? Um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'm not sure the Bible would agree. I think the Bible would put it in a more nuanced way like this. Power is the context in which the corruption of the human heart can be played out um, without accountability. It grows, if you like, the corruption. It, it enables it. It allows it to take root and to spread. But the corruption comes from in the heart. And here, Hophni and Phinehas, by virtue of their position as priests, have the power, the institutional power to indulge their desires, to kind of get away with it, as if you like. Well, you'll be thinking, but where are the checks and balances? After all, when you have power, you need checks and balances. James Madison, who played a principal part in framing the US Constitution, said this about the need for checks and balances. He said, it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices, checks and balances, should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature for if people were angels, no government would be necessary. He's saying we need government to control us and our distorted desires, but government then in turn needs checks and balances to control it and the distorted desires of the leaders. Checks and balances. Well, there were checks and balances in place, but the third area that enabled this was the weak leadership of Eli. The weak leadership of Eli. Look at verse 22 with me. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served the entrance to the tent of the meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading amongst the Lord's people is not good. Not good? That's pathetic. Earlier on in chapter 1, verse 14, we've seen him wrongly try to rebuke Hannah thinking that when she was devotedly praying to God at the altar that she was drunk, and he didn't pull his punches there. Put away your wine, he said. There's no imperative here for them to stop. He just says, it's not the best. It's not good. Not good. Systematic abuse of their role. Reneging on the responsibility of priests. Distorting the very office of priests for their own selfish gain. Not good. And when they push back, there's no escalation. There's no next steps. Eli is exposed as a weak leader. And here's the point. If when there are checks and balances, the people who wield them are weak, they lack the courage to do what is right, then those in power get away and the abuse grows and the corruption grows. Now, we need to learn the lesson here. See those three conditions. 
the distortion of the human heart, the power and privileged position of the leader, and then the weakness of those who could wield the checks and balances to, who don't do that. And it's been a tragic feature, dare I say, as we think candidly about it, of the scandals in the church that these preconditions have been there as well, particularly around the weakness of those who wield the checks and balances. Bishops who had safeguarding disclosures made to them who to a man turned around years later and said, oh, I don't remember that. You know, I didn't take notes in that meeting. Because the truth is that they prized the reputation of the church over the importance of the person who was sitting in front of them as a vulnerable, abused person. Um, leadership teams who were too emotionally invested in their leaders to bring them to book, who cast away the character traits which they knew had troubled them for years, the over-manipulation, the bullying, but they said, oh, that's just him, and after all, have you seen how the church is growing? The Lord will not have it. We need leaders who are strong enough to wield the checks and balances and to bring people to book. And the Lord exposes this so that we might see what it really is, because it's only when you get these three conditions that you start to see the distorted weed of abuse in leadership growing up. Distorted desires, enabled by power, not held accountable by those who wield checks and balances. When you get those three, then the weed grows in the dark, is enabled, and then continues to strangle the life out of anyone and everything that it comes into contact with. So I want to pause to apply this to us for a moment. Do you see how important it is that actually you have godly leaders who are rooting out the idols from their own hearts, but also that you have proper checks and balances? We have them here at Inspire St. James, but don't take my word for it. Feel free to ask. Ask the PCC and the leadership team. You can get their details on the website, or you can ask them on a Sunday. We'd be happy to point them out. If, as you ask in any church about the checks and balances, the leaders push back and are evasive, that is not a good sign. There should be transparency and authenticity and vulnerability. You should welcome that level of transparency. And you need to look for leaders who care more about the glory of God than they do about the reputation of the church. Let me say very clearly, Christ died for people. It's people who are made in the image of God. Victims are made in the image of God. The church is not. It's a collection of an institution, and the Lord may well remove his lampstand. But he died for people, not for the name of a church or the name of an institution. He didn't die for that. One person is more important. Never get into the consequential analysis that says, the Lord's done so much through this church, we can't possibly let the scandal come out, so we'll suppress it. Then we're shot. The Lord won't have it. And we're saying this now here in Inspire, so we can be transparent about it, so you can hold us to account, Mark and I as leaders, ask the leadership team. We have to foster a healthy environment. But also for you, many of you exercise leadership in your own spheres, don't you? Maybe in the home, maybe at work, maybe in a charity capacity. The same preconditions need to be met. Are you rooting out these desires from your own heart? Do you guard your own heart? Do you welcome accountability or are you defensive when it comes? Are you in a position where you have checks and balances in place and are the people who are in those positions of holding the checks and balances strong enough to call you to account when you most need it? If not, you're a fool and you need to start changing things pretty swiftly. Corrupt and weak leaders who are exposed. And secondly, and now there's a message of hope for us, a just and gracious God who acts. Let's look at um, verse 27 of 1 Samuel 2. My Bible and my excitement has moved, so I'm going to need to find it. In verse 27, we see a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? And so what we see in verse 27 is a man of God who comes and brings the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. In other words, in this situation, is God going to speak? Is God going to do anything? Well, in all of these verses from verse 27 onwards, everyone else is passive. Only the Lord is acting. The Lord speaks in verse 27. The Lord declares in verse 30. Uh, the Lord declares again midway through verse 30, but now the Lord declares. And then the Lord acts in judgment at the end of those verses on Hophni and Phinehas. And the reason that the man of God, I don't think we've given any details about him in verse 27, is the point is, is not who he is or where he's come from, but the point is that God raised him up. 
God does something about it. The strongest argument against the allegations of a Christopher Hitchens is that where the church is acting like that, it is not acting in God's name. It is merely claiming the name of God, but it's a gross distortion because this is what God does. God sees injustice. God acts on the injustice. Or to put it bluntly, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? He will. He will. He's not weak in bringing people to book. And what he does here is he acts in judgment on Eli's house. Look at what he says in verse 30. I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. That was the promise to Aaron's line and the Levitical priesthood. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming, Eli, when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling, although good will be done to Israel. No one in your family line will ever reach old age. God acts in judgment removing the privilege of being a priest from Eli's family line, moving it to another family. And he acts in judgment, cutting off the whole family line. So it ends after Eli. He said, I'm going to have no more with it. You forfeited your right to grace. And he judges them. When the hammer of God's judgment falls, it falls swiftly and accurately. And can I say, in a context where we often don't like to talk about the judgment of God and we find it bad news, I hope you find that a comfort. You know, one of the things that happens with the abuse scandals is you, you find yourself looking at what's happened and you, you say, isn't God going to do something? Because very often, tragically, there isn't justice on a human level. With Bishop Peter Ball, you know, it was only in 2015, years after he'd retired, that finally charges were brought against him. And for all of the abuse that he had perpetuated for the 15 years when he was bishop, and maybe even longer beforehand, he got a sentence of two years and eight months in prison as one of the spokespeople for the abused said around the time, two years and eight months for 15 years of sexual exploitation, abuse and grooming of young men who came into his orbit. I am more than glad that Peter Ball now resides at Her Majesty's pleasure, even though this sentence is far too lenient for the gravity of his activities. Peter Ball died in 2019, and you might say, well, where's the justice? He escaped it, didn't he? No, not with God. He's going to have to stand before God on the judgment day when all the books are opened and everything he's done wrong is declared openly and publicly. And if his sin is not paid by Christ, he will face the full wrath of the judgment of God. And as a leader, that is terrible because we know more, therefore we're held to a higher standard. The judgment will be harsher, as it says in the New Testament. He will face the judgment of God. God will act swiftly. I hope you find that a comfort as much as something that's sobering. You know, I know with my two children, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, that one of the words that's closest to come out of their mouths or phrases is, that's not fair, particularly around food. They love food. So whenever it's like a cake on the table and I've only got one slice left, I have to employ my wife's surgical ability to dissect the perfect median through the cake. Otherwise, that's not fair. His bit's bigger than mine. Or if you're British here, you'll get it when you're queuing in a very, very respectful way and someone, you know, cue jumps. That's not fair, you feel. We feel it, don't we? And it matters. Justice matters. And it matters to God. It shows that he cares about his world. It shows he cares about the vulnerable. It shows he cares about the church. He will do what is right. If you struggle to find comfort in the human institutions, find comfort in the justice and judgment of God. But the prophecy here in verse 35 also has real promises of hope for us. Look at verse 35. God says, after judging Eli and his family, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Friends, sometimes you look at a situation like this and you think that it's so dark. The leadership has failed so badly. Is there any way back? Is there any hope? The great thinker Augustine once said that hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at what's wrong with the world and the courage to do something about it. Well, here's the problem. With human anger, often we just leave a scorched earth behind us and there's no hope for restoration. But when God acts in anger and judgment, he always leaves room for grace and hope 
and restoration. There's a beautiful image in the prophet Isaiah that Isaiah returns to a few times in different ways when he talks about God's judgment having come on the land. And he sees the land like scorched earth. He sees trees cut down, smoldering, with the fire still um, hot. And then he sees new shoots of life growing from those tree stumps. New shoots of life coming out of the forest floor. Hope, restoration, change. And here, God speaks messages of hope in verse 35. To switch metaphors, this prophecy here is a bit like when you're walking in the hills, it has a number of horizons of fulfillment. You know when you're walking, you think you see the horizon, and you get there only to see the horizon stretching out before you, and you get there, and then there's another one, and finally you get to the summit, and you see the view, and you think, I'm at the summit. Well, this one has a few horizons. The first horizon is in the life of Samuel. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. Well, who is that, we ask ourselves? Well, in the immediate term, in the book of 1 Samuel, it is Samuel himself. And what's been amazing is throughout the narrative, there's been this weaving in of Samuel's story. As Hophni and Phinehas and Eli's house have declined into corruption and then judgment, so Samuel and Hannah and Elkanah and their family is ascending as Samuel is growing. And there's a compare and contrast, and one of the fruitful things you might want to do in your own reading is go away and compare the two families and see how different they are and see the trajectories they're on. But look at Samuel, verse 11 of chapter 2. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest, as though he, he's passionate about God. He's conscious that his ministry is before the Lord, where Hophni and Phinehas have no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 18, see him growing now, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, now no longer under Eli, notice. So he's growing, he's now got some independence. And verse 26, and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Isn't it remarkable that even as Hophni and Phinehas are being judged, the Lord has already been at work in the life of Hannah and Elkanah, raising up Samuel, the new leader, to bring change to bring godliness, to bring restoration to his house. The Lord is working through the life of Samuel and as a partial fulfillment in verse 35 in Samuel's life. Secondly, well, if you read on and look at 1 Kings chapter 2, you'll see this is also fulfilled in the life of Zadok the priest. If you like the Champions League, then you'll know the theme tune for Zadok the priest when he anoints some Solomon. It's some set to new words about champions, but it's the original piece by Handel. And Zadok the priest, it was under his family line that now the priesthood would continue as it's removed from Eli. But supremely, of course, verse 35 can't be fulfilled by any merely human leader. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. Is there such a person? A faithful person who always concerns himself with God and his glory more than human approval? A faithful person who fully puts away the idols of greed and lust and power from the heart. A faithful priest who perfectly ministers before the Lord and with a passion for his holiness. Is there such a person? There is no such a person outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always, forever. No human being can, of course, fulfill that. But the Lord Jesus Christ is, of course, the perfect priest. Hebrews chapter 6, we're told this. We have this hope. One of my favorite verses. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Just think about that imagery for a moment. If the allegations of abuse have shaken your foundations, think of yourself like a ship who puts down the anchor and the anchor holds. And though you're buffeted around from the storms, you're held in situ. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Think of how different and how wonderfully God restores us and brings hope through Jesus Christ and his true and better priesthood. We've seen in this passage Eli's sons abuse their positions as God's priests. They use their power to exploit others. But Jesus is the true and better priest who gives up his power for the sake of others, to serve others, to bring blessing to their life, not to get his own way. Eli's sons were sons of destruction. Wherever they went, they left nothing but a trail of destruction behind 
ruining the people they ministered over. But Jesus Christ is the true and better priest who was himself destroyed on the cross for our sake so that he could bring life, blessing, and restoration to the people he ministers to. Eli was a weak and frail leader who lacked the courage to do what is right. Jesus Christ drank the cup of God's wrath until it was completely drained. He lacked no courage in taking the humble path to the cross, dying on the cross for you and for me, for all of the ways that anyone in any leadership position, humanly speaking, ultimately gives in to the idols of our heart, ultimately is a distorted leader, ultimately needs forgiveness. And whilst it might not be abuse, it's still not being a faithful leader. Jesus dies so that we might go free. Jesus restores where our anger might just bring scorched earth. Do you want to know how seriously God takes those who abuse their position? Look at the cross. He takes it so seriously he was prepared to give his own son so that the church might be restored. In the words of the hymn we're going to end with today, before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever, forever, lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, which is forever, no power can force me to depart. That's our hope, not ultimately in any merely human leader, but in the God-man Jesus Christ, the perfect priest, the true and better priest. That's the anchor for our souls. Well, as I close, I started by saying that many feel that the conduct of the church, and particularly its leaders, is one of the single greatest arguments against God. But I hope you see it's not an argument against God. The things that people do, distorting the glory and the name of God, are just that, distortions. But here we've seen that God acts, that God cares, that God judges, that God brings restoration supremely through his Son, and the Scripture has in it the very seeds to prevent this in our generation. So let us learn from this, let us heed the warning, and let us lean on Jesus. Let me lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, how we need this. Our hearts desperately need to see the gospel, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're to turn away from idols. Our leaders, I as a leader, we desperately need this if we're to be vulnerable and to welcome accountability rather than seeking after power and our own gain. And we all need this if we are to be voices of justice and courage, but also tinged with mercy and grace, and there might be restoration where there currently is only judgment and anger. Lord, please work, please act, please guard us. Help us to heed the warnings of Scripture. If we think we stand firm, help us to watch out and to listen to your word. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.